Hello and welcome to this introductory lecture on scientific approaches to understanding animal behaviour. I'm going to use the example of dogs barking throughout, so this lecture could be called Why do dogs bark? It will illustrate a range of important scientific principles when it comes to um, studying animal behaviour and introduce you to Tim Bergen's four questions. So this lecture is going to cover some important philosophical issues, which is really important when it comes to the approach of animal behaviour. One of the things that often happens when you study animal behaviour, you do research, is you might publish those results and somebody says, well, I knew that already. And it's perhaps not appreciated the difference between what scientific discovery tells us versus what somebody's opinion is. And I'll address these issues and others in the course of this lecture. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the basics of uh, scientific inquiry, what the scientific method involves. Talk a bit about why scientists can seem pedantic at times when they discuss scientific ideas. They seem to be very nitpicking on particular words and sometimes the language can seem quite complicated and unnecessarily so. But I hope as a result of um, this presentation, you'll start to appreciate why words are so important. And then talk a little bit about the ways that scientists think different types of reasoning, deductive and inductive, explain what those mean. And then address the issue of when we ask a question of why in animal behaviour, uh, recognising that there are many different possible ways that that question could be answered. And it's important to recognise what it, level and what particular uh, type of why question that you want answered when you ask the particular question. And as we'll see, how good you are at defining the behaviour can have a big bearing on the specificity of the answer that you'll get. So most science starts with a basic observation and a question that can be answered with data. And data are objective uh, information, uh, but it may be just a casual uh, observation something that you observe in nature and you start to think sort of well I wonder why that is the case. What's important in science is that we can frame a question that we can test. We can't prove anything uh, for sure but we can exclude competing explanations till we're left with just the most reasonable explanation. Statistics as used in science is often used to try and reduce or quantify the level of uncertainty that we have. So by saying that something, uh, doing a statistical test, we may actually be able to say with some reasonable confidence, it's extremely unlikely that uh, an explanation is actually the case, which helps us move towards an understanding of truth. In science, truth does change. Uh, truth is just the best explanation we have at the time, but it's more than just an opinion. It is substantiated by evidence, and that's a key point to appreciate. So we might make an observation that dogs bark a lot. Different dogs bark, different sizes of dogs bark. They seem to bark at different occasions. That might lead to the question, well, why do dogs bark? And this is the question that we'll explore in the course of this lecture. So why do scientists use such long, complicated words so much of the time? Well, one of the main reasons for this is because many words have many different meanings and so miscommunication can occur. And when we do science, we want to try and be as precise and specific as possible. If the words we use are confusing or inconsistent, as we'll see, then so can the thinking that follows from that. So sometimes scientists in invent special terms in order to try and generate a term with a very precise meaning. Um, but then we find that even some of these terms can have multiple meanings. The risk of misunderstanding is made worse when a given term has a popular and scientific meaning. As we'll see, uh, we're going to talk about separation related problems or separation anxiety um, as an example. But um, if you take a popular term like stress, stress means different things to different people. And one of the dangers is that one person uses it in, in a certain way and another person either um, as a result of that it makes certain deductions about uh, the state of an animal because 
uh, they have a different definition of what a word like stress means. So for some people, stress might just indicate something like arousal. Uh, in other people, it, it mean, indicates that the animal is suffering. So if one person says this animal is showing signs of stress, they might just simply mean that there is a load on the animal and it's having to make an effort to cope, um, but they're not saying it's necessarily suffering. But another person might you interpret that word stress to imply that the animal is actually suffering. And these are the sorts of misunderstandings that can easily happen. And as we'll see when we talk about separation related problems, even we might think of that as a more um, specific scientific term, and it's clearly not the case. So in, particularly in the field of animal behavior and clinical animal behavior where we're managing problems, it's important to define what we mean uh, when we're talking about a given behavior. Because if my uh, definition of separation anxiety is different to yours, then if we're both uh, trying to research treatments, we may come up with um, a treatment which seems effective to me, but ineffective to you because you're studying a different population. So language is important and the words we use is also important. It's particularly important, I think, to adhere to this rule when we um, use the written word. Often when we're communicating with people, for example, in this sort of talk, we might be a little bit more lax in the use of the language, but that can give rise to problems. So whenever you read a paper, especially in the clinical animal behavior field, they talk about a given behavior problem. One of the most important things to do is not assume you know what that problem is, but look for the author's definition of it. And if you can get into the habit of doing that, then um, you'll safeguard yourself from misunderstanding an awful lot of the literature. So what do we mean when we talk about bark? I said, we're going to ask, why do dogs bark? Seems pretty straightforward, everyone knows what a bark is, but it's actually much harder than that. We can all recognize a bark, um, and we talk about barking in dogs in general terms, but the idea of a bark is really based on our personal knowledge. I know what I mean when I talk about a dog barking. Is it the same as what you mean? Well, we're not sure until we test the ideas. So can we come up with a definition that won't cause that sort of confusion? Well, if we define something purely in objective terms, then we have what's known as an operational definition. And that's important in science. We want that objectivity um, and try to avoid any subjectivity. Believe it or not, there is not a precise definition of a bark that is used consistently in the scientific literature. But I list here one that is uh, that has been used in the scientific literature, which may or may not be helpful. It's a short, loud vocalization with an abrupt onset and frequency of modulation that is often repeated rapidly. Well, um, that certainly gives us some of the features of a bark, but does it, could other noises be uh, incorporated there? Well, if we're talking in relation to dogs, this probably does describe uh, most of the vocalizations that we'd consider to be a bark, but that's not very accessible. Is there a better way to try and define it? Let's just look at the variety of barks because maybe this is the wrong question. Uh, is there such a thing as a bark? If we walk down a street, um, then dogs may bark at us. Just watch this video and listen to the different types of bark. Look at the behavior of the dogs as well. Do you think the dogs are all trying to say the same thing?
they would back off. Huh? So I hope you can appreciate from that little clip, which was filmed on a single walk down a single street in Poland, how variable the dog's barks are and also the behaviour associated with them. They were all presented with a similar stimulus, i.e. myself approaching them, but the barks vary enormously. Um, do they all mean one thing? Is a bark a single entity? Well, uh, it's a particular way of dogs communicating. So the answer to why dogs bark is likely to be complicated. So how do we define a bark? Well, we can look at the physical features. Um, we can look at the context in which it occurs. We might want to ascribe some function to it. We might want to suggest um, different types of emotional basis. Or we could look at other relationships. And these are all valid ways of characterising a bark. If we look at the physical features, you'll notice that in the previous recording, the barks varied in their frequency. Um, by that we mean their pitch, um, the rhythmicity, what sort of rhythm there was, the tonality, the mixture with other sounds, etc. Um, how many barks were made, etc. These are all physical features that can be um, characterised. A bark is not a growl, and it is not a whine, and it's not a howl. And in this um, spectrogram here, we can see the different forms of vocalizations. Uh, the top left hand figure is a sonogram of a bark. You can see this sort of explosive energy a relatively short duration, whereas a, a growl has much more variation within it uh, and modulation. Uh, and that's the top right hand. The whine is, is perhaps, uh, it builds up. It starts off sort of 
um, less impactful and becomes more and more intense. Whereas the howl again is an explosion of sound that then gradually tapers off. So we can characterize um, the different vocalizations of dogs using things like sonograms. So a bark would have the typical sort of sonogram in the top left, but as we've seen, there can be a lot of variation within that. If it has a lot of um, tonality uh, and uh, different sounds within it, then we would see more stripes um, within the sonogram. So let's have a uh, listen to some of these different uh, features here. Um, in the first uh, recording that I've got here, we're going to uh, just listen carefully to uh, the quality of the sound. So in that first bark, you can hear different aspects of frequency, rhythmicity, tonality. It's interspersed with growls as well. So it's quite a complex sound. In this second group of recordings, you're going to listen to both the standard poodle and a German shepherd responding to a, toast, uh, to a postman. Um, and then the third recording is actually of a miniature poodle in a similar sort of situation. So all of these animals are responding um, to the same sort of stimulus, but listen to the differences in the bark, some of which may be attributable to breed, some of which may be attributable to the size of the animal. So that was the standard poodle. Now let's listen to the German Shepherd. So the German Shepherd is a similar size to the standard poodle, but you can tell that its bark is much deeper and it also has different uh, qualities as well. So there may be um, breed related differences in characteristics of bark. Now let's li listen to the miniature poodle. <laughs> So a miniature poodle is much smaller, so it can't do the deeper tones. So characterizing a bark just by context, we can see there'll be an awful lot of variability in that situation. We may want to think about the function of the bark. This next recording is of a, um, a standard poodle when it's actually alone. And you'll hear sort of almost intuitively, you'll notice that there's much more emotionality and uh, the higher tones which tend to indicate distress in the bark. So it's a very different type of bark when the dog is alone and perhaps trying to solicit the care of someone compared to when it's trying to repel a postman. And as I mentioned, you can pick up on a number of tones relating to emotion, emotion in this sort of situation. Um, in the final uh, example, 
we're going to listen to a Samoyed, which is separated uh, from another dog by a pen. And you'll again hear a very different quality of bark. And it's not just related to the breed, but it's related to the situation that the animal is frustrated. And you'll notice how um, similar the bark is from one bark to the other. And that's not a, uh, an uncommon feature when an animal has been chronically frustrated as well. And you can compare that to the previous one of the um, standard poodle that had been uh, left alone. So quite apart from the actual sound of the bark, you can tell that sort of one bark was very similar to the next one. And as I said, that might tell us something about the emotional basis. And there are many other ways in which we could actually qualify the, uh, the nature of a particular type of bark. So I hope from this you can start to appreciate that taking something as simple as a bark, at a superficial level, we can call it a behavior, but clearly there are many forms of bark. Oh, <laughs> oh.
Let us now consider barking in relation to um, one particular type of uh, behaviour problem, what is often called separation anxiety, separation related problems or separation disorder. Well, one of the issues that we have in clinical animal behaviour is that while some people might prefer to use one term over the other, these three terms do not totally overlap. And actually, uh, there can be uh, quite substantial differences between the sorts of cases that fit into one person's category versus another. For some people, separation anxiety describes any dog that uh, causes problematic behaviour when it's left alone. Um, for other people, um, that would be too broad a, a definition and they'd use separation related problems to describe that. And they'd only use the term separation anxiety to describe those dogs that um, show and signs of anxiety before the owner leaves. And the term separation disorder suggests that the animal has some sort of um, psychological disorder and mental health problem. So um, separation disorder is a relatively small group of these problems um, because these indicate a sort of psychiatric type problem. There will be some overlap with separation anxiety, but maybe not all animals with the disorder will show signs of anxiety. So the overlap is not perfect. Separation related problems typically refers to a much uh, bigger group, which may include um, dogs with anxiety, um, but also dogs with uh, that are just reacting to things that pass by the window, factors like that. And it will include some of the dogs with separation related disorder as well. But if the disorder results in a depressive state and it doesn't disturb anybody, then it might be excluded from that particular group. So we have to be very careful with the terminology um, and make sure we're clear how animals are defined as fitting within a particular category when we talk about things in clinical animal behavior. So words are precious in science. Um, sometimes we can use language quite loosely, which can be fine if we're just trying to make a general point, but it can interfere with our scientific reasoning. Indeed, the issue of separation anxiety um, tends to make people think that these dogs are anxious, and that might be the case before the owner leaves. But our recent work suggests that once the owner has left, many of these animals show signs much more um, typical of frustration. So separation anxiety may not be so much of an anxiety problem as a frustration problem. One of the things we need to be aware of is we have to be cautious about explaining the cause of a behaviour in terms of its survival value, because that is what we would call a teleological explanation. Um, and it may imply psychological states that don't actually exist. So if we say the animal barks to protect itself, then we are implying that the animal has this goal in its mind. Do dogs actually have that ability? Um, and there is a difference between inferring a psychological um, construct 
um, as the causal mechanism and a subjective state. So we might say the dog's bark is part of a fear reaction versus the dog barks because he is afraid. It's more defendable to talk about the bark as part of a fear reaction because we can define what we mean by a fear reaction. It is the response that an animal shows when presented with a perceived threat. But to say the dog barks because he is afraid is saying something about the dog's uh, internal feelings and we don't have access to that. And that um, can make it uh, more open to uh, subjective interpretation and anthropomorphism. So we need to define key behavioural terms in order to avoid misunderstanding. If we accept that animals classify certain stimuli around them as potentially harmful, then as I said, a fear reaction can be defined in terms of the contingencies that bring it about and the characteristics of the response. But we're not saying exactly how the animal actually fears. So the animals have emotional processes, but whether or not um, how they experience them um, is much less certain. So when we talk about science, we, we're interested in generating facts. Um, and But at the end of the day, those facts are matters of opinion, but they are scientific opinion, and that is different to personal opinion. Personal opinions may or may not be true, uh, but they can depend on unsubstantiated belief. If you believe in something, um, then that can inform your opinion. Um, by contrast, scientific opinion um, must be justifiable um, on the basis of the knowledge we have to date. It may or may not be true. It could be at a later date shown not to be the case, but it reflects at the current scientific consensus. It's reasoned on the basis of the available evidence. If you can't test something scientifically, then it isn't, it can't be science. A classic example of this is whether or not there is a God. Science can't address that question um, because it cannot be tested. That doesn't mean whether there is or is not a God. Science cannot contribute to that. Uh, that's a matter of personal opinion and personal belief. Now, your personal opinions may or may not be scientific, depending on how you frame them. But what's important is to appreciate when something is scientific versus when something is just a personal opinion. It is very much human nature for us to uh, formulate opinion and then select the evidence to just support that belief. That's what's known as the confirmation bias. And that's the way that we tend to operate. We see something and when we're asked to justify it, we just gather the information to support that belief. As a scientist, our job is to think about a statement and then look to see if we can gather evidence to show that that's not the case and if there could be an alternative explanation. And that's the big difference between um, a scientific opinion and a personal opinion. So scientific debate will consider the evidence for and against different conclusions and suggest the most rational answer. And I would suggest that um, if someone just presents the evidence for one side of an argument, then they're probably not um, presenting a scientific evaluation of the evidence. And it's more likely to be a personal opinion, even if it is dressed up as being scientific by making references to papers. Um, so you always want to look at stuff for example on social media um, and on the world wide web and ask yourself are they just presenting one side of the argument um, or is there evidence that they are actually considering the evidence for and against a particular point and then coming to a rational conclusion the question then comes is how comprehensive have they been in covering the evidence for and against or have they biased it because of perhaps either uh, innocent mistake or because they have a particular agenda. The thing about being a scientist is you can have a personal opinion, but you should be willing to change that in light of new evidence. So this is particularly important um, given increased public interest in science and the promotion of specific scientific agendas through social media, which is an ever increasing problem. So please do think carefully on these points.
it's important that you can spot these sorts of traps early on. So opinions that cannot be tested are by definition outside the realm of science. And scientific knowledge is based on objective data and logical reasoning. And we'll talk a little bit more about logical reasoning now. So if we think about some of the features that might account for bark uh, variability. We can think about external events, the different types of triggers, the prevailing environment, and these how these might um, result in different types of bark from a given individual. Or we can think about it, the characteristics of the individual um, that's making the bark. Its size, as I said, larger dogs are going to be capable um, of making lower pitch noises. That's a simple product of physics. Uh, there may be differences in the breed. There may have been selection for certain types of vocalization or certain types of bark. Uh, the developmental stage, and dogs may vary in their bark uh, as, as they grow older. The barking of a, a young pup is quite different to that of a mature adult. What connects the external events to the individual are different psychological states. And whilst we can't know exactly what the animal is experiencing, we can infer these psychological states uh, in a scientific way by going about things in a systematic way and testing different ideas. So making reference to psychological states does not make something intrinsically unscientific, even if it can't be measured directly. It may be possible to infer it through logical reasoning. So psychological states um, are not the same as conscious states. They are what we refer to as intervening variables. They describe the link between the external environment and internal processes. And broadly speaking, we recognize two broad um, types of psychological state in the assessment of behavior. Those relating to motivation and cognition so what, where the animal is perhaps expressing the goal of a behaviour, and those that relate to emotion, which is the personal significance, the classification uh, of the, a particular stimulus in a particular way, uh, and particularly in relation to the social emotions. Uh, classifying something, for example, as a mother, uh, my mother will be different to your mother. Um, we both have the concept of a mother, but it means something different to both of us and it refers to different individuals as a result. We cannot measure these states directly, but they can be scientifically inferred, as I said, through logical reasoning from certain premises. And a premise is simply a statement that is accepted. If the pre premise is false though, then we may come to the wrong conclusion. And that's one way in which we can investigate in science is to explore whether or not the premises are true. The proposed importance of a particular phenomena can be tested both experimentally and clinically using a process of deductive reasoning. If this is the case, then this logically follows. That's what deductive reasoning is about. Um, the scientific use of such concepts can allow justifier predictions to be made um, about the behavior and when it's likely to occur. So given this, my observations, I make these predictions about what is going on. That is what's known as inductive reasoning. And I'll say a little bit more about that. The reasoning is used to connect our ideas to our observations, and we can do that deductively or inductively. Let's take an example of each of those. In the case of deductive reasoning, what we're doing is we take a generalization and split it into its logical uh, requirements. So, if it is said that all dogs bark and that this animal is a dog, then it follows that it should bark. The premise is that all dogs bark and that this animal is a dog. Uh, the conclusion is it should bark. However, this is a Bazenji, and that challenges the question of whether or not all dogs actually bark. The majority of dogs do, but not all dogs. It can be difficult to prove that all dogs bark, but it can be shown more easily to be wrong. 
if you think about it, I'd have to know that I've seen every dog on the planet and on any other planet that might exist that is uh, that might exist in order to show that all dogs bark. But I, it is more easy to show that something to be wrong. And this is what is meant by falsification. When we test ideas in science, we're not trying to show that all dogs bark. What we're actually trying to show is whether or not that statement is true. Or sorry, what we're trying to show is to test the uh, truthfulness of that by seeing if we can falsify it. Can we find evidence that that is not actually the case? And that sort of reasoning, you have a hypothesis that all dogs bark, and I deduce therefore that um, if I can find a dog that doesn't bark, uh, then my hypothesis must be false. Then uh, I've undertaken a study using the hypothetical deductive method. I'm making deductions and I'm using the process of falsification in order to um, test my hypothesis. Let's now look at the issue of inductive reasoning. This is the process of making generalizations on the basis of specific information or observations. So it's sort of the reverse process of deductive reasoning, whereas deductive reasoning is making specific predictions on the, um, on the basis of a generality. Here we're making generalities on the basis of specific information. So if every dog I have met barks, I might suggest that all dogs bark. That's an example of inductive reasoning. On the base of my experience, I make this conclusion. Inductive conclusions are open to being wrong much more than deductive ones. Don't confuse a statement being wrong with the process of falsification used in the hypothetical deductive method. Inductive reasoning is strengthened by additional evidence, and that is a natural human tendency. We but the more we meet dogs and all the dogs we meet bark, so we might want to think that it's more likely that our statement is true. But it doesn't mean that it is true. And it's important to look out for this when you look at what people say about animal behavior. They might cement uh, their arguments with inductive reasoning. And it only takes one fact to destroy uh, that sort of process by showing that a particular dog doesn't bark. So if we want to understand why dogs bark, we begin with inductive reasoning based on our observations um, or our readings and come up with a range of explanations. We then test these ideas using scientific methods. That involves deductive reasoning. One of the founders of modern ethology was Nico Tinbergen and he was awarded the Nobel Prize alongside Conrad Lorenz and Carl von Frisch for their work on animal behaviour. Indeed, it's the only time the Nobel Prize has been awarded for the subject of animal behaviour. They were awarded for the study of ethology, uh, which is very much the European tradition of the biological study of behaviour. In the US, the study of animal behaviour was very much um, developed by uh, comparative psychologists. And ethology is characterized by a focus on observable phenomena and the use of the biological method, whereas the comparative psychologists tend to focus on having animals within uh, a very controlled environment and looking at the rules to understand why a behavior occurred. So ethology is a more naturalistic science in that respect. It starts with those general observations and then you use the deductive method in order to generate ideas that can be tested. One of Tim Bergen's greatest contributions was to highlight the fact that the question, why does a behavior occur, has several different types of answer, all of which are equally valid. And the Four common answers to the question why often referred to as Tinbergen's four questions. And these are articulated in his paper on aims and methods in ethology. And if you Google that title, you'll be able to pick it up um, so that you can freely uh, read the original paper.
And whilst it's, it's um, from quite some time ago now, it is still worth reading. Um, you realise just what a brilliant writer and a brilliant mind um, he and the other early ethologists clearly had in their thinking on these issues. He suggested that um, one of the answers to the question relates to causation or mechanism. You're basically asking, how does it work? When you ask, why is a dog barking? What you're asking is, what are the mechanics behind a dog barking? A second way in which the question, why does a dog bark, might be addressed is actually you focus on the survival value or the function. What is it for? So what's the purpose of dogs barking? The third um, answer to the question why dogs bark might focus on its development. Why does the dog bark? Why do dogs bark? How does it come about from sort of the newborn animal to the adult that it actually barks? What are the factors that influence when it barks and when it doesn't bark? This is referred to as ontogeny. The fourth way in which the question may actually be answered focuses on the evolution of the behaviour. So why is it that um, dogs bark? How does it come about in that situation? Uh, what are the evolutionary forces? This is commonly referred to as phylogeny, how it actually evolved. They all answer the question, why does the dog bark? But they give different perspectives on it. And actually understanding behaviour at all of these levels is quite important uh, when we want to try and make sense of a given uh, behaviour in an animal at a given time. We do need to understand about the evolution, we need to understand about the function, we often need to understand the mechanisms underpinning it and also how it has developed in the individual. More recently uh, a number of great minds have uh, looked at Tim Bogan's four questions and looked at reframing them slightly and changed the terminology. Um, so it's been pointed out that two of those questions, those relating to mechanism and ontogeny, uh, reflect the very um, proximate uh, aspects of the behaviour, the more immediate factors um, that answer the question why. Whereas questions concerning function and phylogeny reflect the sort of longer time course level of explanation than what we refer to as ultimate explanations. However, we could divide the two questions a different way. We could focus on developmental history, whether it be in the lifetime of the individual, ontogeny, or over evolutionary time, phylogeny. They're both um, types of question that focus on developmental history. Set against that is a focus on the form of expression, which could be in relation to function or uh, the underlying causes. Ascribing a simple function to uh, a given behaviour is often unwise. There are, uh, as we've seen, barks are very diverse, and so it might have different functions in different forms or in different contexts. And we now realise that a lot of these processes are much more uh, complicated. So whereas the term ontogeny very much referred to the lifetime development in the individual, we now realise that there are factors um, that affect the, the development within the individual that cross over the generations. And the evolution, uh, sorry, and the development of the field of um, epigenetics shows how genes can be switched on and that can actually be passed on through the gametes to offspring as well. So it is much more complicated. If we think about mechanism, we can think about it in terms of physical mechanism. In the case of barking, we'd be focusing on the vocal cords and also the bits of the brain um, that are involved in it. But we can also ex um, refer to mechanism in terms of psychological constructs what is going on in the animal's head and use intervening variables to explain. In the case of phylogeny, historically, there was a lot of emphasis put on um, the importance of um, evolutionary forces, but we also realize that evolution sometimes occurs as a result of chance events. If a group of animals um, happen to develop and they've got a certain characteristic, this is known as a founder effect. And 
if by some strange mutation, for example, those dogs don't bark, then that breed of dog won't bark. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has any adaptive value. It's just something that happened by coincidence. So when we think about evolutionary explanations, we don't, they're not always um, uh, linked very closely or entirely to adaptive factors. Likewise, when we think about function, um, the, the current function may be different to the original evolved function. A classic example of this is feathers. Um, feathers are widely used for flying, but that's not why they originally involved, evolved. And we also recognize now the importance of cultural effects, and that influences all four of these um, types of processes. Further debate of this uh, can be read in the papers by Ness, Bateson and Lalland. And if you Google Tinbergen's four questions together with these names, then you should be able to find their papers. So when we think about the question, why do dogs bark? We have to recognize there is no single or simple answer. Um, a bark, like almost any behavior, is a non-specific response. The more precise we are in defining the bark, the type of bark we're talking about, the more specific we can be about the answers which might be offered in relation to any of Tim Bergen's four questions. Whether it be in relation to phylogeny, mechanism, ontogeny or function. The less precise we are in defining the bark, the greater the range of possible answers. And that's an important principle to appreciate when we're thinking about animal behaviour. Too often people think about one explanation and they give evidence to support that belief. But as I've shown, hopefully through this presentation, that confirmation bias does not uh, produce necessarily good science. In clinical behavior, we're often interested in an answer that is very specific to an individual in a particular context. Why is this animal doing this particular behavior? And the psychobiological approach that we've developed at Lincoln uses a synthesis of methods from both psychology and biology to help us address this question at the clinically significant level. And this allows us to actually test our hypothesis in relation to a particular individual that is presenting in the clinic. We don't have to do mass experiments. Those experiments will tell us perhaps what's happening more often at the level of a population and what might be normal for the population might not be the explanation for the individual. So clinical animal behavior science is very much a science of the individual. I hope you found this presentation informative. Feel free to review various parts of it. And I provide references and further reading um, here. The first reference is Tim Bergen's classic paper. The next two are the two papers that I mentioned that provide commentaries on it. There's interesting early work from Tembrock on um, canid vocalizations and uh, Sophia Yin provide a new perspective on barking, pointing out some of the rules, and that has been very much developed further uh, and explored by the group in uh, Hungary. And there's some fascinating work, and I give a few examples of their work here. First, it refers to the fact how humans seem to intrinsically be able to classify dogs bark in different situations. Um, and that even occurs with people who've uh, never seen a dog, so who've been blind from birth. A nice summary is found in the Pongratz paper that's listed there. Um, and that gets you fairly up to date with our understanding of barking. And uh, a more recent paper has found that uh, sort of annoying dog barks suggest that they may have specific acoustic features that actually gain the attention of humans as well. And indeed, as we'll see, you know, Dogs and humans have shared their lives for a long time together. And so it's not surprising that um, actually there may well be adaptations in uh, either party that are particularly important to the other and that we're tuned into each other to a certain degree. Thank you for listening.